So now let's talk about how a naive T cell can become an activated T cell. And again, this should only happen if the T cell receptor binds to a peptide that matches its T cell receptor antigen binding site. So here's a naive T cell on the left and it has T cell receptor proteins, alpha and beta, and there is some unique and specific variable region that creates the antigen binding site. And so what this T cell is going to do when it enters lymph nodes is it's going to check MHC molecules to see if they are presenting a peptide that happens to bind the antigen binding site of the T cell receptor. So we have a naive T cell on the left, and on the right we have a professional antigen presenting cell. These are the only cells that can activate naive T cells, so professional antigen presenting cells. So uh, on the left, when we look at the T cell receptor, really we should include all the proteins present in the T cell receptor complex. I typically just show the alpha and the beta protein because that's what has the antigen binding site. But in fact, there's a whole complex present in the T cell receptor. And that complex includes these CD3 proteins that bind to both the alpha chain and the beta chain. And also there is an, a cytoplasmic protein called the zeta protein. And that is a cytoplasmic protein that associates with the um, cytoplasmic tails of the alpha and the beta uh, chains of the T cell receptor. So this is actually the true T cell receptor complex. It's not just the alpha and the beta chain. So, that's on the surface of all naive T cells, and um, depending on if this is a CD8 T cell, it's going to check MHC1s, or if it's a CD4 T cell, it's going to check MHC2s. So, let's say this is a CD8 positive naive T cell. So, we know that CD8 will bind to the alpha chain of MHC class 1, and the cell is presenting MHC class 1, so it's got a peptide on its surface. Now, this could be a self-peptide, this could be a non-self-peptide, a peptide gotten from a virus or a bacteria. Great. This peptide is presented to this naive T cell. Now, this naive T cell has an antigen binding site generated via BDJ recombination and junctional diversity, so it has a unique and specific antigen binding site. So, what we're going to test here, first, there are going to be a number of interactions that are going to occur. The CD8 protein, it's going to bind the um, alpha chain of MHG class 1. It's going to hold that in place. We know that the um, alpha and the beta chain of the T cell receptor have strong affinity for the um, uh, MHG molecule. That's what happened in positive selection, so we know that occurs. And now we test to see, does this bind peptide? And let's say this one, it doesn't bind. That could be a viral peptide. It could be a bacterial peptide. But this T cell receptor doesn't have the proper shape to bind that peptide. So this T cell will not activate. All right, now let's say this T cell, same T cell, it looks at another MHC presenting another peptide, a different peptide. So same thing is going to happen. The CDA protein will bind the MHC molecule. The alpha and the beta chain will bind the MHC molecule. And now, if you look, the shape of the peptide matches the shape of the T cell receptor. So now, there's a very strong affinity between the T cell receptor complex and the uh, MHC peptide molecule. If you have a very strong interaction here, now we're going to activate the T cell. So we have created a T cell synapse. It's an extremely tight extremely high affinity complex. So the T cell receptor does recognize, has high affinity for this peptide loaded on this MHC. That's great, we found a match. So we gotta convert this naive T cell to an activated T cell. How does that happen? So there are two signals that need to be sent into this naive T cell in order to fully activate it. So one signal is gonna come from the T cell receptor. So as this tight complex forms, that triggers some changes inside the naive T cell. One thing it does is it activates a kinase called LCK. LCK is a protein kinase. And when this immunological synapse forms between a matching T cell receptor complex and a peptide loaded on MHC, 
that's going to activate the LCK kinase, which is going to phosphorylate another kinase called ZAP70. So ZAP70 becomes phosphorylated. Now that ZAP70 is phosphorylated and now activated, ZAP70 is going to phosphorylate the ITAMs. What are ITAMs? This was uh, very similar to what happens in B cell receptor activation. ITAMs are immunoreceptor tyrosine based activation motifs. So in CD3 proteins and in the zeta proteins, you find tyrosines in these special areas, these tyrosine activation motifs. And these tyrosines, they're just sitting there and they're not phosphorylated. But now we've got this T cell synapse forming. The LIC kinase activates the ZAP70 kinase. The ZAP70 kinase is a tyrosine kinase and it is going to phosphorylate the tyrosines found in the ITAMs. And like we said, these are tyrosine-based activation motifs. So once these tyrosines become phosphorylated by ZAP70, that signals a chain reaction, signal transduction that goes into the nucleus, which your book goes into detail with, but I don't really care to go into great, great detail into that. But this is the first signal that will activate a T cell. So it is the phosphorylation of ITAMs that is all triggered starting by this T cell synapse forming. So this T cell says, yep, I found a match. Let me activate. Now, hold on, we, gotta, we need some more permission. We can't just let the T cell activate right now. There's another layer of, of signal that needs to go into the T cell in order to fully activate. But this is our first signal, the T cell receptor engaging the peptide and finding a match. All right, well, what's the second um, set of signals? Well, it has to do with a protein on the surface of a naive T cell called CD28. We've got to engage this protein if we want this T cell to activate. So what engages the CD28 protein? So uh, this um, requires us to remember that there are professional antigen-presenting cells. These are the only cells that are supposed to be able to activate a naive T cell. So dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. They are all professional antigen-presenting cells. And now we're going to see what unique feature they have that can activate a naive T cell. So all of these cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells, they can all um, sense an infection. They all can detect an infection using receptors. So all of these cells have toll-like receptors. So if they engage a toll-like receptor because they bind some foreign molecule, that can send a signal into the professional antigen-presenting cell to activate this process. They have other receptors like the Manos receptor, B cells have their B cell receptors. If they're engaging something with the B cell receptor, well, that must be an antigen. It must be a pathogen. So B professional antigen presenting cells can use a number of different receptors that will engage a pathogen. And if that takes place, what these cells will do is they'll turn on a co-stimulatory molecule called B7. So they turn on the B7 genes to make the B7 molecule. The B7 molecule once it's turned on, it goes to the surface of the professional antigen presenting cell and it engages the CD28 protein. So B7 molecule binds CD28. And when you have this protein-protein interaction that takes place between a professional antigen presenting cell and a CD8, CD8 uh, or any naive T cell, what happens is the second signal that the T cell needs in order to fully activate. So this B7 molecule is essential to signal naive T cells to activate. And what's unique about this B cell, the, I'm sorry, this B7 molecule, is that it is only found in professional antigen presenting cells when there's an infection detected. So it is uh, induced, it is turned on once the professional antigen presenting cells have engaged an antigen using any number of receptors that normally engage pathogens. So now that this professional antigen presenting cell has had these interactions with a naive T cell, the T cell will go from being in, in a naive state to being in an activated state. And now that the T cell is activated, it will do a number of things. It will proliferate, which we'll get into the next video, and it will um, uh, go into its effector function, 
depending on what type of cell this is, a CD4 cell or CD8 cell, it'll have a different effect or function. But this video covers all the interactions that are required for a naive T cell to become an activated T cell. And this whole process is taking place in the lymph nodes or other lymphatic tissues.